and Rico. Welcome to the Pain in My Cast podcast. I'm so excited to have you here today. Um, not only are you now a published author on Barnes and Nobles and Amazon, you're kind of like you know, a badass, I would say. You're like super outgoing. You have an entrepreneur minded spirit. You're running listings on Airbnb. You have a corporate career. Like, I am so impressed by you. And I think it's funny because one of my first episodes I did, I was doing a podcast with a friend of mine. And I was saying, I said something like, you know, like this girl was being such a Karen. And I paused myself and I was like, I cannot say that because I literally have a friend named Karen and you're literally one of the coolest human beings I know. (laughs) So welcome to the podcast. Do you get like frustrated with like the whole like Karen name situation thing? I'm not frustrated, but I feel like it became a big thing during the pandemic. And obviously we were all trapped inside our houses. So like anytime I would get in an Uber, like no one had anything to talk about. And so I was cool with it at first, but then it's like having the same conversation over and over again. And like people were getting so much excitement about finding out that was my I was like, okay, here we go again. And then they would like start with like Karen jokes. And I was like, okay, I can't do this like all day, every day. That is so annoying. I feel like, I think I saw that like people were getting their names changed. No like, way. Yes. <laughs> what? I saw some article because it got so bad. Like people would like bring it up and like annoy people so bad that they would get their names changed. <laughs> which I think is crazy. And then like I go to Starbucks like every day, like I'm addicted and I go through the drive through and instead of saying Cassandra, I'm like Cassie and they always hear me as Kathy. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be a Kathy. Like Kathy is the name that I feel like I'm just like, I don't want that connotation with my name. I guess that's the one good thing about my name. I don't think they've ever messed it up at Starbucks. That's good. Karen's kind of hard to mess up. There's only one way to spell it. I feel like also they can't mess it up because they know better. And, With yeah. the stigma, like you can't mess up Karen, you know? Yeah, They're but literally like, everyone. Where's like, the manager? Oh, like, <laughs> that's what I am saying. Like anytime I was introducing myself to people during the pandemic, they'd be like, oh, where's the manager? Or like, oh, you're a cool Karen, right? And I was like. <laughs> Uh, yeah okay Uh, anyway that is so funny um we like became friends like I think during the pandemic like I want to say like 2020 2021 maybe yeah and we were all like on a boat I got put on a boat with you yeah I was like pissed at my boyfriend at the time I like ran away from him I went and got on this boat (laughs) and you were on the boat yeah and you were on the boat with one of my best guy friends so I like in my head I assumed I was like oh he's talking to this girl like maybe he's dating her <laughs> not knowing because you never know yeah but I think you guys were just friends really yeah and I hit it off with you like yeah, right thank away God you were there yeah it was so fun yeah I, I definitely would not have had as much fun if you yeah. were there I feel like the like the whole like Lake Travis Austin boat scene is like really weird I think it's overrated it's overrated like no offense to the people that go every single weekend but they think they're so cool yes and I just I'm like oh. that's like I feel like you get out there like during lake season and you like get out to the cove and like a bunch of the girls on the boats are like kind of mean like they're sizing each other up yes. and I'm like I'm too old for this yeah and I just I like to think that I'm outgoing and nice and friendly but I don't know if I'm becoming introverted or what I just don't have it in me to like so socialize anymore either (laughs) like don't talk to me (laughs) I think I think you just get like selective as you get older you know yeah because I used to try really hard like when I was younger like even like I did the whole damn thing like I got a boob job really young like I did all this stuff like thinking that. that I would like you know be one of those girls and it's just like that's so not me yes and I think that's what I've realized too like I always have these goals and then I set them and then I get it and I'm like I wanted this so bad and now I'm realizing that I have it it's not who I am at all right yeah isn't that weird so weird yeah and like I feel like you think you want things and then you get them and it's you're not happy and like yes it's like you're always wanting more I don't know what the law is called but like yes. abundance like nothing's ever enough Okay, it's so funny that you're bringing this up because I literally just had this exact conversation yesterday with a friend on Town Lake. We are talking about how it seems good on the outside to be really ambitious, but then we were talking about how we're never happy or satisfied. And I was like, even right now with where I'm at in my career, like everything that I have in my career, I wanted so badly a few years ago. And then like, I can't even enjoy it because I'm just 
like now I want to be further ahead and that's how it is and so I don't know if being ambitious is really that good of a thing it's like chasing like perfectionism I almost feel like yeah and one of the things I feel like I bonded with you so quickly on that boat is because I remember talking to you about like our jobs and I think I told you like back in the day, I had a really hard time, like, staying at a job. Like, I would just get, when I was younger, I would get frustrated. I would quit. I would not give two weeks notice. I would be like, fuck you, bye. Like, because I would just feel like the job was taking my whole soul and eating up everything. Yes. Yeah, so I remember you telling me that you kind of had, like, that same problem, and I was like, okay, I love this girl. (laughs) Like, I'm not the only one. So it felt good, you know, to connect with you in that way. Yeah, and that's the other thing, too, about, like, all the girls that go out to the lake. They're hard to connect with. Like, you keep it so real. Like, I don't need to pretend that I'm perfect. We can just, like, cut to the chase. Yes. Uh, you know what I think about, too? Because, okay, because, like, boat season's going to start coming up again. I was like, I feel like the young girls, like, early in their 20s, like, they're always, there's those girls. You, like, see them on Instagram Every weekend, they're out on Lake Travis, like, they're on some boat, there's probably two guys on the boat, like, you- Trying to get with them. (laughs) Yeah, you know those girls are, like, looking for boat daddies, like, out on Lake Travis, and I'm like, how is this even fun? Like, I have no energy to entertain some man that I Uh -uh. want nothing to do with. Hell no. So. Good for them, though, at the same time, this is how I know I'm getting old, like, I remember being young and thinking I'm just so cool, and now it is- weird being like oh wait there are younger cooler people than me but I'm also like good for you because now that I don't have the energy to do that I'm like you enjoy your energy yeah I think the thing I've learned and I think this is this is a line from a movie showgirls which is like a stripper movie basically that I just watched (laughs) the reoccurring theme love that but um there's always someone younger and hungrier coming down the stairs So I'm just like, that's so true. So I feel like I've... So true. As I've aged, I've just like accepted like, well, there's always going to be someone younger and cuter and, you know? Yeah, that is so true. Yeah. So I like that line. Um, But obviously you've been in Austin for a little while. Yeah, like five years now. Five years? So you're basically an Austinite. Yeah, I definitely feel like I am. Yeah. And then where did you grow up? Because I know your family's in San Antonio. Yeah, so... Okay, I never know. I'm 28 years old, and to this day, I still don't know how to answer this question because when people (laughs) are like, where are you from? Because I was born in Mexico City, and I lived there for six years, and my dad's family is all there, but then my parents got divorced, and my mom's family is in San Antonio, like, Shirts area, so we moved to Texas when my parents got divorced. That way my mom could be with her parents. So I pretty much feel like I'm from Texas, even though I'm not. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I um, guess you came here five years ago. How old were you? So, okay, after high school, I went to Texas State, and then I moved to San Francisco for a year. I was 20, 21, and then I moved here to Austin right after San Francisco, and, and I was like 22, 23 at that point. Yeah. And I've been here ever since. Texas State. I feel like Texas State has, like, its own, like, reputation, at least in my it's mind. wild. <laughs> like, yeah. how is going to school at Texas State? Uh, well, it definitely, like, meets its reputation about it being a crazy party school. Um, so I actually w- was like, I want to get out of Texas. I want to, like, see the world. So I had gotten accepted to this little private school in Tampa, But it was so small that they didn't have room for me until the spring semester. So during the fall semester, I didn't have anything to do. So I was like, oh, I'll just go to Texas State. It's an easy school. And then I'll transfer. And I fell in love with it. I joined a sorority. And so even though it does have a reputation for being like a party school, I just think it has such a sense of community, which I honestly really miss. Because even though Austin is amazing, it does not compare to the sense of community that Texas State has. I don't know how they pull it off. Maybe because it's such a small town, but there's just so much personality there, so much culture, and everyone is so nice. Like, it just, I was like, I got to stay here. I'm not transferring anywhere else. And it is a great school. How is, like, the sorority? Because I always, like... I always laugh because, and I think I've told you this, like, my little sister's more, like, 
the like sorority type of girl like she's blonde has her little blonde girlfriend she's so cute and then even though I'm blonde I'm like no don't talk to me no way in hell I could ever see myself in a sorority so I just like was that fun like what was that like So going back to the thing of like thinking you want something and working so hard for it and then realizing it's not who you are, that was my sorority experience. Like I was like, oh, this is exactly what I want to do. So I danced like my whole childhood and my like lifelong dream was to be a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. But then when I got Texas State, I was like, never mind, screw dance. I thought about trying out for their drill team, which is very good. But I was like, no, I want to do sorority life. And my mom was like, no, don't do it. So I did it behind her back and I lasted two years, but it was like a very long drawn out two years. And it was kind of hard to accept that I just like wasn't one of those girls. It just felt very inauthentic to me. And I don't want to say that like being a sorority is like paying for your friends because I think if I ever have daughters, if they want to do it, I would support because it did do a lot of good things for me. Like they check in on you with, everything you do like they make sure that your grades are good they make you check in at the library they make you do community service so like it was good to kind of have like a second parent in a way um but just like the cattiness of it was exhausting I don't have the energy to deal with girls like that so I ended up dropping it was that bad yeah because what I, I assume like I just feel like I don't I can't find these like sororities to be like you know that they would be all that welcoming and friendly and there's just so much that goes into it because my little sister rushed or and it was like you have to have so many outfits they have to be a certain color like you have to have you have to have money I feel like to be in a sorority yeah yeah and they are very control I mean I thought that part was fun I guess you could see it as controlling when they like tell you what to wear every day and you do have to dish out money for like just you have to buy outfits every single week for whatever events going on um I thought that part was kind of fun but just like the girls being so me I remember me and one of my best friends from high school we joined it together (laughs) and one time we were like crying to the I forget what you even call them but like the volunteer ladies who like are not in college anymore but they come and like watch over us they were in that same sorority like when they were in college and we were like it's just so hard to make friends like we don't understand what to do um yeah, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that would be tough, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. And then what'd you get your degree in? Marketing. Marketing. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm a marketing girl. Yeah. But I don't have a degree, but I am <laughs> a marketing girl. And then, so you left school and you went to San Francisco. Is that what you said? Yep. So was that like your first big girl job out of college? Yeah. Okay. What were you doing? Marketing? Sales. Okay. Um, I was like a personal stylist. I sold custom clothing to men. That's um, a good job. Like, that's a good way to meet some men. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is how I found my ex-boyfriend. So, yeah. <laughs> you see where my mind is always <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I was like, what does she mean, a good job? <laughs> but that was a chaotic job, honestly. Was it, like, were the customers, like, rude? Like, the clients? Because they're, like, custom suits? Um, no, actually, no. The clients were so cool. That was the good part about it. It was amazing sales training. And I was really intimidated going in. Because think about the people who can afford custom clothing. It's like CEOs, like very wealthy people. And so I was intimidated to try to sell sell to them. I was like, I have nothing in common with them. Like, I don't. But they were, what I learned is that once, you know, think about like anybody in a management level or even VP. Like, they still have that ambition and drive behind them because they're still trying to make it. And so they're the ones that like kind of what's this thing like have a stick up their ass yeah but once you do make it then they just chill out because they realize like there's more to life and they don't have anything to prove anymore so they my clients were so so cool it just was shocking because so my marketing or my major was marketing and then I had a sales concentration And so in the sales program at Texas State, they just, like, obviously sold us the dream. And they were like, oh, you just get to, like, wine and dine clients and didn't tell us about any of, like, the hardworking part. And so I got to San Francisco. And part of the way that we had to get clients, like, when I interviewed, they were like, oh, it's 100% referral base. And I was like, oh, cool. That's easy. Like, I'll just sell to everyone's friends and colleagues. And then I get out there and they're like, oh, you have to like go approach people on the streets and get their business cards, which kind of sounds fun maybe for like the first one or two times. I was like, oh, I can do that. I'm outgoing. But like when you're doing it all day long, it's exhausting. 
And then even like getting referrals was kind of hard because like think about it, if you had a personal like clothier or like personal stylist and they were like, hey, give me your friends' numbers. I want to sell to them. Like <clears throat> which friends would you get? Like a lot of guys were like, I don't know like who would <laughs> – buy for like it's kind it's such a personal thing it was just like a grind and hard work and I just was expecting like everything to be handed to me so that was a rude awakening that's tough but I feel like it's kind of like a good first job to have after college because it sounds like it really threw you out there yeah how much do those suits cost just curious do you know so they started at like I want to say around like 1200 but then some went up to like 5000 okay so they're pretty expensive. Yeah. Yeah. But I think what's kind of cool about that for your first job is, like, the networking. Yeah. Because you're putting yourself, like, around, like, higher value people, right? Because they can yeah. afford nice clothes. So, obviously, they're doing something right in their career or something, maybe. Yeah. No, I agree on that part. And as awful as it was just to, like, <laughs> chase guys down the street <laughs> all day long. And then I also would have to, like, go into uh, buildings and just, like, see – what um companies were there and then like walk in and just like try to get in front of like lawyers or whatever without an appointment and so it was so hard and obviously uncomfortable as like a 20 year old just barging in and secretaries were like get the fuck out yeah but it definitely shaped me I feel like it's so much easier to this is like not, it's so much easier to sell when you're like a pretty girl Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. not that those people are, like, easy to sell to, but if you're approaching them versus, like, some other business guy, I feel like they'd be more willing to listen to what you're trying to sell. Yeah. Um. Obviously, like, the company would never, like, admit to this, but it just was very funny Um. going to the sales conferences with, like, the entire company. There was not a single sales rep that was not attractive and, like, a perfect 10 head to toe. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> kind of fucked up. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's so normal. Like, it, it shouldn't be. But it shouldn't yeah, be, it is. But it's like medical set, like anything. Yes. It's like it's so annoying, and you can deny it all day long. But like, being pretty is like an asset for selling or yeah. getting people to listen to you. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and then I feel like living. I was talking to you about the cost of living in Austin. Mm-hmm. It's so expensive. Yeah. But how the hell did you afford to live in San Francisco after college? Oh my God. Yeah, that was so rough. I like I would love to move back out there or to New York, but now that I lived through it right out of college, I'm just like petrified by my experience because I was making no money and. Also, San Francisco was so popular like a few years ago and they don't have um, leasing offices where you can just walk in and there's like an agent there to help you. It, you have to do it all through Craigslist. Luckily, my brother lived out there, but I was like homeless. I just stayed with him for a month and a half until I found an apartment. Like I was going to open houses like every night. I, it was like a full-time job being on Craigslist, trying to like filter through the scams and then trying to like get an invite to an open house. And you would show up to these open houses and it would be like maybe a five bedroom apartment and like one of the bedrooms would be open. And it would be so crowded. You couldn't even like walk through the apartment to see it because that's how many people were competing for this one bedroom. And so what I ended up getting was a two-bedroom apartment, and it was four girls in there. So we had to put, like, a little foldable, like, temporary wall in there, and we all paid fourteen fifty each. That's crazy. Insane. It was like living in a dorm. Did you have a car, or, like, did you use public transportation? No, neither. That's the nice thing. So San Francisco is seven by seven miles. Okay. It's tiny, and yeah. so you can just walk everywhere. If I needed to go, like, a little bit farther out, um, I would just Uber, but I pretty much walked everywhere. It was so nice. See, I've only been to San Francisco one time, and I loved it, and I got on the BART. I don't know if you're from, it's like the, yeah. it was like the scariest experience of my life. And like, yeah, I never went on it, but I'll, I know what you're talking about. I'll like ride the subway in New York. Like I'll, I'm down for like public transportation, but the BART in San Francisco was like scary. There was like, yeah, like the, there was like a little station and the guy who worked at the station had to like lock me in there with him because there was like a homeless guy going crazy. <laughs> and I was like, and I just, and this was a few years ago. And San Francisco, I feel like it's just gotten crazier and crazier where there's, like, yeah. needles or something when you're walking around, like... Yes. Now I just find it comical. But 
I would have to show up to work, I think at like 7 a.m. So I would walk to work when it was still dark. And I remember like several times I saw people passed out with needles still in their arms or, and this was in the financial district, like a very normal part of San Francisco. (laughs) Yeah, but that's where all the homeless people were. One time I saw people just having sex like on a cardboard box what on the sidewalk yeah on my walk to work it was very entertaining but kind of scary at times that's so crazy and it's like because I feel like San Francisco has this like energy to it or at least a few years ago where it was so fun and so beautiful yeah and now I feel like it doesn't have that same kind of vibrancy because of like I don't know maybe it's the pandemic and the homeless people or something like that but I know. I don't know what happened. I guess during the pandemic, I haven't been out there in like maybe two or three years, but going back to the rent thing and how expensive San Francisco was, I think part of it also had to do with me just being so young and like ambitious that I didn't care. I just was willing to like try anything and do anything. But yeah, honestly, like being broke and sharing a bedroom with someone was not a big deal to me because... A, I was hardly ever home. Like, it was really just a place to sleep. But B, the energy, it just, I had an amazing experience out there. I would recommend it to anyone. Yeah, that's so cool. I love that you got to live in, like, a big city. Yeah, like I feel like, me too. Because I grew up sheltered. I never really, like, put myself out there in ways like that. So hearing your story and even just, like, you know, having an apartment with, like, three other girls and navigating that, like, that's a really good experience. <laughs> like, I can't even imagine. Like, I've only lived with guys or by myself. So. You are so lucky. Yeah. That was always my dream, especially after going through all that girl drama in college. I was like, I just want a guy roommate. That sounds so chill. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. Um, so you left San Francisco. Yeah. And then you came to Austin? Yeah. Okay. And then did you move here with the same company or did you go start somewhere else? Yes. So because I wasn't making that much money and it just was such a hard job like it was such a grind I was like okay this might not be for me and I was thinking about looking for other jobs like starting the process I hadn't even started yet and like one day the VP of sales for like the whole country just showed up to the office and was like Karen I need to meet with you I was like what the fuck Um, so he was like, look, we know you're not happy. Like, we know you're kind of on your way out and just what can we do to keep you? Not that like by any means I was like their top sales rep. I literally was right at college. I got so much (laughs) to learn, but I don't know. I think, I don't know why they offered that opportunity to me, but I just was like, you know what? Just move me back home. This is really overwhelming to try to figure all this out here by myself. And at the time I still like was the the company was like kind of cultish so I still was like very into the company um but then so they moved me to Austin and it was the same bullshit I was like this is just hard and it's not for me what because that company I feel like I know quite a few girls who because I was on the boat with you and there was a few girls on the boat who had worked for that company I think oh no way oh yes yeah and they had the same experience yeah so is there like a I feel like is it something do they program with like Texas State yeah okay they recruit out of that school okay um and I mean it's hard like I don't want to talk so much shit about them because they really did it was great sales training and it really did like shape me um just to like work hard but I mean if you think about it like to make a living San Francisco is so expensive and even Austin like to make a living and be able to pay for your own bills off of selling clothes like think about how many clothes you have to sell and when you're finding your own clients like there's not that many clients to find in order for you to pay all of your bills like it's just kind of unrealistic yeah that's crazy like I can't even imagine like trying to find clients that way because it's not like you're like at Nordstrom or Neiman Marcus and like having people come to you yeah you're like literally going out there and hunting for them (laughs) yeah and you're like oh I work with this company and they're like what the fuck I've never heard of that (laughs) god well it's nice that they brought you to Austin yeah thank god so they got you back here and then you worked with them for a little bit here still yeah I think like six months is it because I almost wonder because like Austin like I don't feel like people dress nice necessarily yeah, no, like some people do but it's like you know like all the tech CEOs and stuff wear like jeans and t-shirts which it's nice it's comfortable which which oh, I can't talk which I'm sure they probably did that in San Francisco too right because it's like tech. Yeah, it's so techy out there but like was it harder to sell here or was it harder to sell in San Francisco 
Um, I kind of think it was like the same. Okay. I mean, I had more clients in San Francisco because I was out there for longer than I was here in Austin. Um, but I did run into the same challenge because, and I think anywhere in the whole country, literally no one wears suits anymore. Right. And so this company did sell casual clothing, but everyone wears, like, workout clothes, Lululemon. Like, it just, there's not really a market for that kind of a thing. I know. It's kind of unfortunate. Like, I kind of wish there was, like, more of a market. But, like, because I feel like back in the day, people used to dress. Yeah. Really nice. Back in the day, I feel like it would have been such a fun job to have. Yeah. Because, like, people were dressing up. You probably have a ton of clients. Yeah. And then now it's, like, everyone just wears Lululemon yeah aloe yoga yeah so now I guess it'd be like a cool side job but I would not recommend it for anyone to try to like make a living off of it yeah I think you'd make more money commission at like lululemon yeah probably right like crazy (laughs) (laughs) so you stayed with them here and then I don't think you had the same job when I met you on the boat no I think when I met you I was working for a digital marketing company okay I think so after when I moved back to Austin after that company, I then went to a competitor, but it was a startup. And after seeing like the tech startup life in San Francisco, and that's what every friend I made out there, that's what they were all doing. And it just seemed so fun. So I was like, I want to get into that. So that was my way in, like working with a competitor. They were like, you have the good experience for it. We'll take you. And that, But it was kind of just the same thing. I was like, this is just not paying the bills. So then after that, I went to um, this company. It was like IT outsourcing. And that was a mess. And then I went to a digital marketing company. And I did account management for them for a little bit. Okay. Yeah. And did you like it? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, overall, like, if anyone asks me if I like my career, the answer is no, not really. Yeah, it's it's funny because I feel like you're so free-spirited and just, yeah. like, you know, really, like, have this entrepreneur – I can't even say that word – entrepreneur. <laughs> Entrepreneurial. <laughs> See, I can't do it. <laughs> I think I have, like, a speech impediment. No, I do, too. There's, like, certain words I can't say. Same. Or sometimes, like, I just literally can't form sentences sometimes. Like, the words just don't come out. Yeah. Like, maybe I need help. I don't know. Oh, I definitely do. <laughs> In a lot of areas. <laughs> so you basically kind of ended up quitting – corporate for a little bit right I tried yeah but then I realized I had bills to pay so now I'm back (laughs) (laughs) but I feel like talking to you you had some really good realizations because like we were just talking to Ryan who owns the podcast studio and he quit corporate and kind of built this podcast studio and his thing you know so he kind of had that creative stuff going yeah but you did the same thing Because you kind of quit working in corporate and then you woke up every day and were like doing a bunch of different things that you had never done, I think, when you were stuck in the nine to five grind. Yeah. So, okay, that's the thing going back to like if I like my jobs. It's not, I mean, corporate America obviously pays my bills. It's like a great thing for our society. But I do just feel really trapped and like I feel like it kills my soul I just don't think it's for me I think I'm meant to do something else like more creative um and so a few months ago I only had enough money to last me for like three months before I ran out and then like had to go back to a job so I gave myself those three months because every time I try like I have a therapist and I really have like for the last seven years that I've been out of college I really have tried to figure out like what do I want to pursue outside of corporate America but it's really hard because I, I don't know, like just nothing really comes to me. I'm just drained all the time. And so that was part of why I quit. Cause I was like, let me just give myself this opportunity to not have to like invest all of my energy into this job and let's just see what comes from it. So I went on a mental health break. Thank God I was able to pull that off. Um, And yeah, I just woke up every day and like all these ideas started coming to me. And they just never come to me when I'm working in nine to five. Because like I just wake up in a nine to five and I'm like, oh God, here we go again. Like it's like I'm so laser focused with the tasks I have to do. Like just nothing creative pops in. But when I wasn't working, I just like I did the craziest things all the time. Like one day I decided to apply for The Bachelor. And then that same day, I put my place on Airbnb. 
Um, and then one day I woke up and I was like, I just feel like writing. And I did remember, so my therapist always recommends to try to like dig deep into your childhood and figure out like what you wanted to do as a kid and what you were passionate about. And I do remember just being so chatty. I would get in trouble in class all the time. My mom, poor thing, would like get calls all the time by the principal because I just could not shut the fuck up in class. Um, but people always told me, like, I would go home and just, like, tell my family about, like, my days. And so people always told me that the way that I would, like, talk and describe, it just was so descriptive. They were like, you should become a writer. Um, and so I kind of remembered that. And then I never really did anything about it while I was working. But then, yeah, like I said, it just came to me one day and I just got in the zone. I just, like, had so much to, like, pour out of me. And I ended up writing a book, and then I just uploaded it and published it. I know. We have to tell everyone what the name of your book is, so I'll let you steal the thunder and where people can get it, too. So it's called Manifesting a Size Zero. It's only a digital copy, so you could either get it on Kindle through Amazon, or Barnes & Nobles has it, too. I forget what their version is of Kindle, but Nook, I I think. I don't know. I don't. I like reading like physical books or like on my iPad. I don't have like the there's like the Nook or whatever. Yeah, there's so many apps now. I know. I'm like iPads easy or yeah. I don't know. I don't have all this stuff. But. No, and that was the issue too when I put it out. All my friends and family like wanted to be supportive and get it. And they're like, Karen, what is this Kindle Nook stuff? Like they're like, do you not just have a paper copy? <laughs> <laughs> I think even on your iPhone though, like I've done it. You can read books yeah, on that's your what iPhone. I do. Yeah. yeah, I think it's funny too because like. So I haven't read your book. I'll be transparent. I'm going to because I think oh. friends should support friends. But obviously your book's like about fitness manifesting a size zero. Yeah. Um, and shout out to you because like half the pandemic, I would see you running the trail with your dog, Henry, yeah. like all the time. Yeah. Like you're always out there working out. So, Yeah. Yeah, well, okay, the funny thing is, and I write about this in the book, is be careful what you wish for because – I think like my whole life and probably any girl can relate to this, how we just do want to be, I mean, society shoves it down our throats to like be skinny, be model like. And so I think we always just compare ourselves to others. And so for like my whole life, I've always just wanted to be skinny and look good. And like I would work out. So, like, I danced my whole life. Then in college, I tried CrossFit. And because I was so much weightlifting, that actually made me, like, chunky looking. Um, And then, I don't know. Like, I just – I would get bored of whatever workout phase I was in. And I never really saw results from it. And so then I tried to, like, actively manifest it. And the thing that I learned from that is – when you stop trying is when the manifestation comes and it's never going to come in the way that you expect it, which is why I say be careful what you wish for because I would like try to force it, you know, and like even if I didn't want to work out, I would be like, oh, well, my goal is to like be a size zero. It was never my goal to be a size zero, but it was just like I want to be fitter. So I have to work out whether I want to or not. And I think that was just blocking my manifestations. And so when I kind of just forgot about it, I then through therapy at the same time, like not even correlating the two together, um, my therapist made me just do like deep inner child work and dig up what my insecurities are, which at first I was like, I'm not insecure. Like I'm a very outgoing, confident person. What are you talking about? And I realized that actually was all a front to like protect my inner child who actually had a really low self-esteem. And so wanting to look good was like a way of trying to protect myself so that way I wouldn't have to admit the truth that like I wasn't happy with who I was and so then I had to look and be like why am I not happy with who I am so then I had to do more digging and I realized it all led back to part of it is society like shoving thoughts down our throat and so I had to realize those were not my own thoughts and so um it was kind of hard to separate like okay what thoughts have I adopted and then what thoughts are actually mine. And then the other part was my parents' divorce and just realizing, like, it, it's kind of hard to explain because when my parents got divorced, I never took it personally because my mom put me in therapy at a young age. But I think part of that message just somehow stuck with, like, my childlike brain that not receiving the love that a kid needs just somehow equated in my brain that, like, I wasn't good enough for society to then meet those expectations. So... 
I think part of meeting my manifestation of becoming a size zero was digging up all of that trauma and coming to terms with it. And then at the same time, the pandemic happened. So I used to hardly ever be home. And also just going back to when we were younger and like always active and being social. And so being home, I was like, well, what do I do? Um, And so I think out of boredom, I started ordering HelloFresh kits. I did that. It's fun during the pandemic. Yeah, right. It was so fun. Like, we had nothing else to do. (laughs) Finally learned to cook. Yeah, I was never home. I I couldn't eat any more sandwiches, and I didn't know how to make anything else. Um, (laughs) So I kind of just, like, fell into that. It wasn't, like, you know, I came to HelloFresh with the intent of, like, oh, let me figure out how to eat healthy so I could get abs. It was more, like, out of desperate boredom. And then... I also adopted a crazy ass dog in the pandemic who had so much energy and like taking him to the park and making him do tricks at home wasn't enough. And so I had to start running with him. And like, I got up to six miles and I have never ran in my life before, but he just drove me so crazy that like, I, I just, that was my motivation. I was like, I can't deal with this at home. Like we have to go on runs. Um, And then what else led me to it? I think that's pretty much how I got to the size zero. But yeah, obviously I could have never predicted all of these ways that helped me get there. So my advice to anybody when they're trying to either work towards a goal or just manifest something is don't even worry about the how because you don't know. If you already knew, then you would have that result. So just kind of like let the universe deliver the answers to you. I literally think that's so beautiful Um, because – I'm huge into manifesting and I feel like we grip so hard to like things that we want or expectations of ourselves, and we don't really get them or receive them until it's that point where we let go. Yeah. And then also like I'm a child of divorce. I don't know. How old were you when your parents got divorced? Six. That's so young. Yeah. See, I was like 14. So I was like middle school. Yeah. And it's like, I think the divorce stuff can like profoundly like affect body image and like sense of like worthiness in this weird way. And I don't know why, but maybe it's the receiving love or like not receiving the love that you need. So, cause I kind of get where you're coming from because I do the same thing. Like I'll be like, Oh, if the external looks perfect, then no one needs to know what's going on in here. Like, you know, I look cute. Who cares? They don't need to know what's going on in here. Yeah. Yeah. And the way my therapist broke it down too made so much sense that whenever like any kid that's born to this world, obviously they need shelter, they need to be fed, and they also always are going to crave love from both sets of parents and that's what they need for the brain to develop in a healthy way. And so when you don't get that, then the brain kind of just gets fucked up in the development process. I don't know. A psychologist could probably explain it way better than I could, but... That makes a lot of sense. Like, yeah. this is like, I'm going to ask you a tough question. Yeah. But obviously, like, I know you and your mom are close. Mm-hmm. Are you and your dad close? No. So, okay, during the pandemic, God, a lot happened. I don't want to, like, bring up, I don't want to bring up sore subjects where we're, like, crying in the <laughs> podcast studio. <laughs> and, I mean, it'll probably be healthy. That was another thing I had to learn to release emotion. Yeah, I'm a crybaby, so go <laughs> for it. No, I need to be. <laughs> um, but, no, it's not a sore subject. I blocked his number during the pandemic. I just realized it wasn't healthy to because I I had tried to maintain a relationship with him but it was so surface level it was like we were pen pal buddies just like all the guys I end up dating (laughs) funny pattern um so yeah I was like if I'm gonna have any chance at like making a clean slate and becoming healthy I just gotta cut off communication yeah I feel like that's hard because like I have the like kind of like the exact same experience like at a certain point I even blocked my dad too no way yeah And so it kind of, it's kind of weird with like dating and I don't want to like tap into that daddy issues shit because it's so annoying to me. I know. But it's probably relevant in some ways, but I've seen guys who have like mommy issues too, or like daddy, like everyone has issues. I hate that that's the term because it is very relevant, but everyone's just kind of killed it. Yeah. (laughs) Like, it's kind of unfortunate. Yeah. But then I feel like I look at, like, the men that have, like, shown up in my life, and I'm like, well, like, you know, maybe I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. I don't know. Do you Like, ever... subconsciously. Yeah. Yeah. No, same. Yeah. It's so hard. I feel like, I'm, I'm like, how much more therapy do I need to do? <laughs> <laughs> I think I told you this because we're all about therapy. I'm all about yes. therapy on this podcast. 
But, like, my therapist, I've gone to therapy since I was 16, so right after my parents got divorced. And I went to the same therapist for 10 years until I was 26. And I went to her, like, not so much, like, maybe, like, once, twice a month or whatever. But we became, like, best friends. I love that. So now I can't go to her <laughs> because it's not, like, going to therapy. Like, she she we're just like, like out. friends I could see that because sorry to interrupt you no. um that's how I feel about my therapist and sometimes I just want to be like I love you but then I have to remind myself like Karen that's really fucking weird <laughs> she's a professional that you pay but I totally <laughs> get it and I feel like they have to feel that way too though because it's like I know right you're bonding with these people and you're kind of learning their whole lives like that's what friendship is yeah and like my therapist knows me better than I know myself better than my parents know me like better than anyone yeah does your therapist like give you like actionable items or like things like yeah she tough on you or like what is she like with you I don't want to say she's tough yes she's tough but like I just think she's realistic okay um but it's good because you know like I'll say things I can't think of anything specific but she'll like make me realize that that's not like normal not that there's a normal way to be but like the things that I accept or, like, my standards. Because, you know, we don't really know anything different other than, like, ourselves and how we live our own lives. And so unless someone points it out to you, then you wouldn't really ever know. But she does give me a lot of exercises, too. She got me into meditation. And she's always giving me journaling topics. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. I love her. Because I feel like manifestation, like, some people think it's all, like, woo-woo kind of. But I think what it is is you're building confidence in yourself because you're showing up every day for yourself, right? Like, if you look in the mirror every day and you tell yourself, oh, I'm beautiful, I'm skinny, that's you showing up for yourself every day, which builds confidence. So there's nothing that, like, woo-woo about it, you know? Yeah, no. It's just a smart way to live. And, like, whether you want to believe in manifestation, manifestation or I can't talk either (laughs) whether you want to believe in manifestation or not like you could either we are all always manifesting so you could either do it consciously and get the results that you want or you can just be ignorant to do to it and do it subconsciously because manifesting is all about energy because the energy that we're showing up with on the inside is what we attract like in the physical world so I don't know if this is going to make any sense, but I think the easiest way I can explain it is, like, think about somebody who's stressed out all the time, maybe, like, can't pay their bills, has a ton of kids to take care of, like, it's just not in the best situation in life. And then they're just, like, everywhere that they go throughout the day, they're, like, carrying this negative, stressed-out energy with them. And so even, like, if a blessing or something magical crosses their way – they're like with such a negative eyesight that they're not going to notice it or think that they're worthy of it. Like, so that's what I mean about attracting it. So you could either actively work on your own energy to then attract something different or just keep going about it the way that you're doing it now and you're going to not get the results that you want. Right. I mean, it's like, I feel like people are just energy. Yes. Yeah. It's like, I think people forget to look at people like that, but we're all just energy and souls anyway. Yes. Right? Um, The other day, my mom and I were talking about uh, fillers, because I hate how my, when I smell, sometimes, like, my upper lip goes, like, all the way up and shows my gums. So I was like, I think I'm going to get fillers in my lip. And she was like, oh, my God, you better not do that. And I was like, Mom, we are just souls and a body. It is just a body. It will be okay. It's just a body. And that makes me laugh because every time my mom sees me, she's like, did you get more lip filler? And I'm like, my injector, who's, her name's Morgan, she's awesome. She literally won't let me put anything else in my lips because she's very, like, cautious about how she does it. But my mom literally gets so mad. And I'm like, no, mom, it's like lip gloss plumper. Like, yes! it's, not, it's not even <laughs> lip injection. No, your lips look great. Thanks. And then I have, like, tattoos, which you're not supposed to put bumper stickers on a Ferrari. But I'm the same way. I'm like, this is just my flesh. Yes. Like, it's just flesh. And, okay, going back to my book, it's so funny, too once and like going back to her saying how when you want something so bit so bad and then you get it and then you're like wait it's not like I hyped it up so much not that like I don't appreciate my body like I have grown so much confidence in order to get this body so I'm grateful for that but now that I like am pretty fit and have abs for the first time in my life I'm yeah like, you look really hot like just <laughs> jumping in there like your body looks fire so like, do you oh, thank you <laughs> um but okay do you agree like now that we're at this place 
and that it's like oh wait it's just a body yeah I think yeah it's just a body and like you have to treat your body well yeah yeah but it's like it all starts with your mindset too, right? Yes. Because then when you feel good, you're gonna want to eat healthier and like all these things. Yes. Because like when I was younger, I used to try so hard, like so hard. Same. And like I would do all these diets. I would be in the gym like six times a day, doing like yep. hit workouts. And I think especially for women too, like the hormones and like cortisol and like stress stuff. When you're, like, working out all the time and, like, dieting and restricting, it puts so much stress on your body. Yeah. And then when you finally let go, you're, like, you just start dropping weight. Yes. And that was the thing, too. Like, when I wanted to look good to fit into society's standards, I think I was putting my body under so much stress and just, like, making it all about me. And then when I took it to that approach, what you were saying, like, oh, that let's make this body work for me and, like, let's give me more energy throughout the day then you're kind of like making your body work for you but then through that process that's when you realize like oh it's literally just a body like it's not me yeah well I mean you have to feel good about yourself you just like wrote a book like you look beautiful (laughs) like you're like in the best shape ever you were the sweetest thing seriously and then I mean I feel like the whole time I've known you I don't think you've been in a relationship yeah no I love that I met you at the end of mine when it was really toxic because I think it's cool just to get to sit here and you see my like kind of transition from getting out of a toxic relationship to like healing myself kind of again yeah but lucky for you I think you were single the whole time (laughs) (laughs) lucky for me it has been really cool though to watch you and I mean I even told you the other day I was like holy shit because I hadn't seen you in a while and I was like holy shit you look amazing not even like your body but just you're glowing That's so sweet. Oh my God. I have like chills because I feel like when you have someone in your life that's like not supposed to be there, it's like you can't even, you're not even functioning. Like you're in like survival. I was in like survival mode all the time. I couldn't even think about anything like my career, where I wanted to go in my life, like, you know, eating like nothing. Like I just was like in shock and like frozen basically. So when I saw you and we got coffee the other day, when you said that, I was like, this is so sweet. And like, it's just my whole energy, which we keep talking about, just feels better. Like, Aww. I can't even sleep right now because I'm like so happy and like oh. amped up all the time. It's I weird. Love that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But because I think, you know, it's nice that you've been single because I think being single is great and like building your self love, you know, and yeah. all that type of stuff. Um, you know, and not just being with anyone. Yeah. Well, and that's also what I've learned. My freaking therapist, like, God, I should give her all the money Shout that out I gave to, to my Karen's college. therapist. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> she is a saint. Um, but that was another thing that she taught me, too, how I have to really work on myself and my self-love, which I didn't realize that I didn't love myself. Like, I just, you know, everybody carries on with their day-to-day life. We never stop to think about these things unless we take the time to go to therapy. Um, but, yeah, I realized I had a lot to work on before – I ever get into another relationship do you feel like um you're at a point now where you're like ready to date honestly no no because a part of me is still really unsatisfied and unhappy with my career like now that I'm back in corporate America because I have bills to pay I am like watching my soul deteriorate day by day And so I think that just goes to show not that I have to be like the perfect version of me in order to date because that's never going to happen. We're constantly evolving, but I just don't think it, I wouldn't be able to show up as like fully myself when I have this like negative stress carry on with me still. Yeah. I feel like that's so hard because it's like, you don't want to like carry that stress into a relationship. But I mean, I know you and you'll figure it out because you do and you'll ha- you're you doing so many different things all the time. Yeah. But I was talking to you and I don't know if you're okay with bringing this up, but you were dating a guy for a yeah. little bit. What was his name? Or we'll make up a name. Yeah, let's make up a name. Um, um, let's call him Ryan. Yeah, Ryan. So you were dating this guy, <laughs> Ryan. And he lived um, somewhere else, right? He didn't live in Austin. Yeah, no. Okay. So you're dating a guy from like another state and you met him, I think on like a vacation or something. Yeah. Yeah. And then what happened from there? Because that's kind of like long distance dating, which that's tough. Yeah. So, okay. I know 
you know, some people say they don't like long distance. Sometimes they do. I had never really done it. And my first impression of him was pretty great. So I was like, whatever. I don't need to like make this whole 30 year plan out. Like I just know that I met him. I had a great time with him. And like, I want to talk to him right now in the present moment. So like, let's just talk to him and see where it goes. Um, but yeah, that didn't really go anywhere. It's kind of crazy. I don't know how we ended up talking for almost a whole year. Like I would go through phases where I was like, I can't do this anymore. But then I came back and then we talked for like a few more months. But looking back, we were just literally pen pal buddies. Like I only saw him every three months. Like after I met him, cause I was on vacation. Um, I think we texted for like a few weeks and then it kind of died down. And then he started texting me like every day, but he didn't come down for like maybe three months after that. It just was very sporadic and it, it was kind of hard in the moment because when you talk to somebody every day, like my date, my mind was like consumed by him. And so I thought he was interested and it would eventually lead to somewhere. And then it just hit me one day. I was like, oh my God, it's been almost a year and we just haven't really progressed. Yeah. So I don't know if I recommend long distance. <clears throat> it sounds like you guys had like a really good emotional connection, right? Like if you're talking to someone on the phone, a lot right were you talking like in texting so yes and no like compared to okay. an actual ex-boyfriend that I've been in a committed relationship with like this guy was not there emotionally for me like I remember so when I was at that digital marketing company I stopped working um for that company and then I didn't get another job until like maybe three months later I had all these trips planned lined up that summer so I was like you know what like fuck this, I hate corporate America, let me just take a break and then I'll find another job later. And he was kind of upset like when he had come into town to see me and then I like just mentioned it and he was like, what? I can't believe you didn't even tell me that. Like we were talking every day and you never mentioned that you like weren't working. So like, yeah, we were emotionally connected but not like to the extent that I would be with a boyfriend because I didn't want to open myself up that much until I like got the commitment from him or like we progressed further yeah that's really tough like and I told you yeah. I, I I have a hard time dating because I've been dating and it's hard to like open up to people yeah it's very tough I think because we're just so jaded at this point yeah that's like I feel like guys almost like prefer like 21 year old women or something because yes. they're like fresh and like and they're fun they're fun they care. they've never been hurt they're not worried about anything like and I I I see that. I see where they would like that. But I also think there's something very sexy about being a woman and not being a little girl. Yes, I agree. But, okay, you know what? So I grew a lot from this, like, halfway non-committal situationship, whatever that was called, because I had moments where, yeah, I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, I don't want a pen pal buddy. And I would, like, try to talk to him about it. So I guess that was, like, the woman in me. But then the fact that I somehow managed to stick around for a whole year that was like the child part of me which now looking back I'm like okay I can't do that anymore because obviously being that part of like the child did not get me anywhere yeah I mean I think it's tough because I'm really big into like masculine and feminine energy because I think it's really important yeah and I think it's tough for women because I don't feel like a lot of men are tapped into their masculine energy at least not nowadays yeah no because like in my opinion, like a man, I've heard this before, but a man's kind of like a man and a woman are like a cup of wa cup of water together. So the man's kind of supposed to be like the glass, like strong and sturdy, consistent. And then the woman's kind of like the water in the cup, like free flowing, soft. But you have to have that container to like be that feminine energy and be like free flowing. So if you're not feeling like that person's like supporting you and being that safe space for you to open up, how can you even tap into your feminine energy? That makes so right? much sense because I was just thinking, as you were saying that, I was thinking, I was like, wait, I didn't really feel like it was safe for me to open up that feminine side of me. Yeah, and it's so unfortunate because I don't think men understand that they have to be the one to be that stability to let the feminine come in and like have that security because men are supposed to be, in my opinion, protectors. Yeah, and I think, I don't want to speak for all women, but I think we all want that. Yeah. Like, we want a safe space. Yep. 
Yep. Have you heard of that um, lucky girl syndrome? On- yes, I've been seeing it on TikTok. My other girlfriend is obsessed with like lucky girl I syndrome. I love it. And every day I see her, she's like, we do not chase, we attract, we do not <laughs> chase, we attract. And I'm like, okay, okay. And then I'm a big Kevin Gates fan. Like I listen to like a lot of ghetto trap rap. <laughs> love. But he said something on a podcast interview, and he was like, um, the flowers just are. The the bees are the ones that chase the flowers, and the flowers just are. And oh. I was like, that makes a lot of sense. Like, guys are the bees, and we're the flowers, and we're just supposed to sit there and just be. And then the bees come after us, if that makes sense. That makes so much sense. Like, but- we're not even supposed to chase. I, I don't think. I think men are supposed to chase us. Yeah. Maybe not. No, 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 no. <laughs> I definitely agree. But it's just hard in today's world. Like, I think part of it is hard for me. And I feel like you could probably relate to this too. I don't want to speak for anyone else. But what makes hard for my feminine energy to come out is like, it's not like back in the day where, you know, our only goal was to get married. Like, we have to pay for our own bills now, and, like, we have to have our own careers. Like, if I want to live in Austin, Texas, like, I don't have a guy knocking at my door offering to, like, pay for my downtown apartment. Like, I have to figure it out on my own. And so I think I do have to bring out a lot of my masculine energy into that, and then it gets carried into dating, and oh. it just obviously doesn't really work out. No, I agree. I totally agree because I feel like I'm the first, like, I don't need you. I pay all yes. my own bills. Like, fuck off, basically. Yes. But it's like, I don't want to be... It's I like having a career, but, like, what else am I going to do? Like, I have to go work, or yeah. do I want to, like, sleep in, on the street? Like, <laughs> I don't know. But I feel like I always lead with that with guys. Like, I kind of lead with that. I'm like, fuck you. Like... Same. I'll go buy my own Louis Vuitton <laughs> bag. Like, get away. <laughs> and because that's the attitude that we have to have at work, if we want to, like, survive and keep our job yeah and so it's hard to turn it off when you go into dating like how you are in one thing is how you are in everything yeah I feel like I like I almost feel like it's almost like part of the agenda which that's I don't know if you know what I mean when I'm saying that but just like kind of like with society lately because I feel like family structure is so important and it's kind of becoming broken a little bit because I saw yeah. some stat it was like I can't even remember how many percentage of women over 30 aren't even gonna have kids I think going into like 2030 okay I saw a really cool TikTok the other day that put it into so much perspective for me and it talked about how yeah like all millennials are really confused because we have our parents to like that's the example that was given to us which is not what we're actually doing like you know getting married like just being the stay-at-home wife and so we're the first generation that's having to figure it out like there's not a path that's been uh what's it called like waved out for us which makes so much sense because I feel like every day I'm just like confused I'm like what do I do (laughs) so confused and like I always wonder what that's gonna look like like when I'm married because I like yes I look at my mom she's like from Alabama she's southern like she was a stay-at-home wife and then I mean she got divorced so that kind of went to shit for her you know but I'm like it's just I don't think it's not happening that way anymore yeah no yeah And it made me feel better, too, because I feel like my mom and I bet everyone's parents, like, they just don't understand where we're coming from or, like, why we're living, like, the way that we do. No, they totally don't. (laughs) And it makes me, like, sometimes I just try to remember, like, they're a different generation, but then other times it doesn't make me feel good. But that watching that TikTok, I was like, okay, this makes perfect sense. Like, they just have never seen this before. No, they're so confused because, yeah. like, my parents are separated. My dad literally asked my mom. He was like, like, is Cassandra a lesbian? Because <laughs> <laughs> she's, like, 28 and she's not married. So, like, what's her problem? I mean, I wish we were. Maybe it would be easier to date. It probably would be so much easier. Like, I could just tap into my feminine and like be soft and girly or something. Yeah and then maybe we would know how to communicate because like it's easier to know what a girl is thinking and feeling with a guy. I feel like I'm just like dating another species. Yeah. I can't figure them out. Yeah it's so weird too because like I know for myself like I know I'm like the epitome of like feminine like energy like my whole apartment's pink. I have like so cute. Playboy magazines. I know nothing about sports. You know what I (laughs) mean? So I'm like someone please just let me like lay around naked and look at the moonlight and be like feminine okay <laughs> like, well when you figure out how to do that let me know because I am down for that too <laughs> oh that's so funny yeah 
But that's because then I feel like you have to like living in Austin, we have to like step it up because the cost of living is like so expensive. One of my coworkers the other day, I was at work and I just got a new car. And he's like, you should put your car on Turo, which is like the car rental service. And I was like, hell no. Like, I just bought this new car. It's mine. I'm going to drive it. No one's touching it. And then he's like, you should also list your apartment on Airbnb. Yes. And I'm like, I guess I just need multiple streams of income. Yeah. To live here. Yeah. And I, I was like, no, I don't want anyone in my space. I don't want anyone touching any of my things. And then you told me you've been running an Airbnb. Yeah. Business. And I was like, okay, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> because we do need multiple streams of income, especially for me being in sales. My income is so up and down. And every time I interviewed a company, you know, they pay me like such a low base pay that is not enough to even pay my bills. And then they sell me the stream like, oh, you're going to make this much money. And then shit happens. I work for startups. Their products break all the time. They lose clients. Like they never hold up to their promises. And so I'm at the point where I'm like, okay, when am I going to go get another job at another startup? Like that's all my resume has. So that's really like, I'm just so deep into it. Like, yeah you're just to get a startup job but I'm like it's gonna be the same story everywhere or I could just start finding other streams of income yeah um I feel like it's scary like I feel like I get scared like I need to have more streams of income because yeah. just watching the tech layoffs that have happened lately I'm like this is so scary like I know it's like from big people that work at big companies like who would have thought like Meta would be like laying off all yeah. these employees and it's like Austin's like the tech hub and I feel like a few months ago I'd be like looking like online and I would see people like posting jobs for like crazy amounts of money because it's so competitive here and then now people are getting like laid off so I'm like it's smart to have multiple streams of income yeah and that's also the point I'm getting at now too because I think the nice security part of having like a corporate job is like they pay for your insurance all that kind of stuff but yeah you just never know what's gonna happen or like in startups like the um VP levels are constantly changing and so when they bring in new ones they a lot of times want to like get rid of sales teams and then just start over with fresh faces like things are always changing so I just I think I'm realizing I cannot rely on only one source yeah it's scary yeah it's like really scary it's funny because I'm like thinking about like my, my corporate job and I'm like hmm maybe I'm brainwashed because I'm like really obsessed with like everything that my company does oh good enjoy and that, that. Is good but I like doing this because it's like a creative like fun thing for me and it's so funny though because I went on a date the other day I went and got coffee with this guy and for like an hour all I did was talk about my job <laughs> And I know I love my job, but I'm also like, am I just so brainwashed? This is all I know now. (laughs) No, enjoy that. I wish I was brainwashed. I'm at the other end where anything anyone says to me, I'm like, fuck you, fuck off. (laughs) It it would be nice to just like be brainwashed. Yeah. I think you should just keep writing books. I do too. But okay, so after I wrote the first one, how many pages is it, by the way? Because I'm going to not long. It's only like 40 pages. I'm ADHD, so, like, I get right to the point, and then I got to move on to other things. Right. Um, And it was, like, the first one, too. I was like, you know what? Because I kept coming back to it every day and was editing it, and I was like, let me just put it out there, see what happens, and then if I like it, I'll write another one longer. But, like, I figured if I don't ever – if I keep editing every day, I'm never going to post it and, like, get anything done with it. Um, So, anyway, after that – I really liked it so I was starting to write another one and I was already at 40 pages for the other one and I was like barely getting started but then going back to my corporate job because I have bills to pay um so unfortunate like why do we have bills I'm like Uh how did I end up in this life where's my like Like, rich husband I'm just kidding (laughs) (laughs) who's gonna pay for my bills um but yeah I don't know I'm back to like the soul sucking thing I was talking about like I just don't I'll try to write and I just, nothing comes to me anymore. Have you seen, um, there's like something I've seen where it's like the five to nine before my nine to five, like no. what you do, like the few hours before your nine to five. Um, it's something I've been kind of doing. It's like, I get up really early. Like I'll get up at 5 a.m. I was so inspired when you told I don't, me that. I told you cause I can't sleep cause I'm happy. So I get up at like 5 a.m. And I've been like, that's when I'm like editing my podcast and doing stuff like that. And then I'll like make breakfast, have coffee. Like it's my time to myself. And I do all my creative stuff before I have to do my work because I'm the same way. It's like, if you go do that whole 
day of work at corporate, it's like, where's the creative energy going to yeah. come from? It does. And like for me, I'm most productive in the morning. I don't think. I see I'm not. Yeah. So I like not get out of bed. But then, but even like for work, like if I start working at 9 a.m. by like 12 p.m., I'm like, I just get irritated because the yes. most, all my good work was already done because I just like knock it out so fast. Go, 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 you know? Yeah. So. I want to try that. Yeah. I like getting up early is hard. Like I definitely so could not go like work out or do anything physical that early, but I just kind of like try to tap into myself for like a second. I love that. Yeah. It's really nice. Cause I do that when I wake up, but then it goes into my work hours and like, I just need to get up early. I think what's hard, like, cause I hate the days when I like wake up and I'm like, oh shit. Like I just have to like go straight to work like yeah because then you you don't have a second for yourself yeah no and then that's when I start feeling like a slave yes to a company or something because I'm like I don't even have a second to breathe so how am I supposed to give you anything of myself yeah exactly yeah okay I'm gonna make that a point to try yeah. this week because we need a second book <laughs> and a third <laughs> I know honestly I really do want to pursue this it just felt so nice like you know when you work out or you go on runs like you release so many endorphins I don't know what gets released like creatively or whatever from writing, but it was so nice. Like I just released so much and felt so free. So I definitely want to keep on to this if I can just find that like creative spark in me again. That's so cool. I love that. Like I love words are great, you know, literature is great. Actions are even better, you know, in terms of dating. And then the fact that you like actually like wrote a whole book, like, you know what I mean? Because I think people – are hard on themselves and you could be like oh you know I just wrote this one book like you know I don't know if I'm gonna do two or three or whatever but like shit Karen like who else has written a book like you know (laughs) not most people that's pretty cool I guess you're right I do realize that I am really hard on myself and I I need to stop I like journal about this every day and then I go on with my day and it's such a bad habit that like I really do need to break it Um, because that was the great thing. Like, I think I'm being hard on myself now. Like, oh, I didn't figure it out during those months while I wasn't working and now I'm back at corporate America. But, like, even writing a book, because I remember telling a few of my friends, they were like, what do you mean you're, like, quitting your job? And I was like, I don't know. Maybe I'll try to write. And so when I actually finished the book and uploaded it, I was like, wow, I stuck to my word and I wasn't just talking out of my ass and it felt really good. Yeah, I feel like whenever you try to do something outside of the norm, though, too, people are always like, oh, like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know? Yes. And then it makes you question yourself. And it's yes. like, if you could just not hear the outside noise, it's so much easier. So much easier. And that's why I didn't tell that many people. I told a few friends that, like, I saw and so then it naturally came up. But I did not pick up the phone to tell anyone for that reason. I was like, I don't want to hear anyone's opinions. And the few friends I did tell, I was like, do not give me your opinion. Just keep your thoughts to yourself. Otherwise, you're going to ruin it for me. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> that's so cool. It's oh. funny, though, like when people are like, oh, my God, that's amazing. You wrote a book because I'm like, I don't know. I just was so lost. My soul was dead. I was just trying to save myself. But thanks. I guess it's cool. I think that's when people do like the best things, though. Yeah. 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 I agree. So, well, I'm so excited. I got to have you on the podcast Thank and you. I'm going to link like your book so people can go and get it. Um, but where can people stalk you on like social media and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty much only on Instagram. It's dammit.karen. Okay. D-A-M-M-I-T-T. Cool. We'll put that in the show notes, but thank you so much. Like, thank you. I'm so glad we're friends, and I'm Thanks. so glad I got to have you on here. So fun. I know. Isn't it fun? Yes. Ah, I'm moving my mic out of the way. <laughs> that was so fun.